Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Don Street. Don Street is a campaign organizing agency that specializes in community organizing. We only work with people who want to build power and make the world a better place. That includes community-based organizations, trade unions, progressive businesses, and socially democratic parties across the globe. We develop community engagement strategies to win campaigns both big and small, train engagement staff and volunteers in the Gantz framework of leadership, organizing and action, and we help folks craft their story through the practice of public narrative that connects people through shared values and moves them to act together. If you want to create change in your community in 2024, then hit us up at donstreet.com.au. Today's episode was also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. As Australia's number one plaintiff law firm, we believe the law should serve everyone, not just those who can afford it. We've helped influence some of Australia's most important legal decisions, including equal pay for women and Indigenous workers, and have helped over 500,000 Australians get the compensation they deserve. Morris Blackburn Lawyers, experience you can count on. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left and organising podcast out every Friday that dives into the progressive campaigns and issues of the day with the people leading in from home and abroad. It is the end of the month, which means it is time for another instalment of Feeney's Hour of Power, otherwise known as the Feeney Files. This month, David and Stephen cover a range of topics from around the world. They will touch on Trump's conviction, the upcoming UK election, which just got called and of course they will touch on news from home such as the fallout from the federal budget and the AEC's boundary redistribution and what that means for labor come the next federal election don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you get your podcasts for those on google podcasts you'll find that that entire platform has migrated to youtube music so head over there if that's where you like to listen to the show An update on our Patreon, it will be launching very soon. Please keep an eye out on our socials for the link to our Patreon. You can join it for free or for as little as $2.50 a month. You can help support the show so that we can do more things like live shows around the country and you get more out of Socially Democratic, whether that is more content, merchandise or simply connecting with fellow fans and essentially becoming a showrunner for the show. Please be sure to give us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and um, if you like, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And for everything else, please follow us at Dunn Street on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Okay, let's get to today's episode. We are taping this one on a... Wednesday, Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon in sunny California. Always wanted to say that. And if you know, you know. Um, I am on my way to a organizer conference in uh, Canada and I'm at um, LAX. And uh, apologies to our listeners if the audio isn't 100%. I don't have the equipment with me. So we're literally just doing this on our, oh, I'm recording this on my phone. But joining me from the future, because it is Wednesday where this person is, is the uh, former campaign director for the Labor Party in Victoria, member for Batman, Senator, and all the other things. But he's also the my co-host when it comes to our monthly episode of the wrap of federal politics, uh, which we call the Feeney Files, or Feeney's Hour of Power. David Feeney, welcome back to Socially Democratic. My pleasure, and always a pleasure to be your guest, Stephen. Uh, we've got a lot to get through today. We've actually expanded our, our list of topics that we are going to branch off to uh, foreign shores, given that I am in the United States right now. So we're going to talk There's about just US too politics. too much happening in the world, isn't there? It, it really is, actually. It's a bit nutty. US politics, UK politics, uh, and then we'll talk about domestic politics um, so since we're in the States, since I'm in the States, let's start with US politics, massive news during the week, 37 charges against uh, former president and reality TV host Donald Trump, uh, star of Home Alone 2, um, Donald Trump uh, was found guilty by a 12-person jury in the uh, District of Manhattan during the week. First former president ever to be found guilty uh, and is now a criminal pending an appeal. 
Uh, and David, I'm curious to get your thoughts on uh, this outcome. First of all, um, we'll talk more about what implication we think this might have on the actual presidential race in November. But first of all, I, were you surprised by the by the the uh, the, the the jury's um, outcome or, de- or decision? Uh, I didn't know what to expect, really. I mean, the US justice system is, uh, you know, has some unique qualities that the Australian justice system doesn't have in the sense that um, uh, it has a lot of jurisdictions and a lot of different ways judges are appointed and, and you know, sheriffs are elected and different police forces and DAs. And um, so I didn't know, really. I, I wasn't brave enough to make a prediction. It was obviously imagined in some quarters that it would only take one MAGA devotee on the jury um, for there to be a hung jury and for Donald to escape. Um, But, I mean, the conviction is obviously big news. I mean, I knew it was big news when I um, watched some American TV, some news casts coming out of the US, and... Any residual faith I had in American democracy was deeply battered by the experience because I watched, on the one hand, news presenters from sort of, you know, CBS and NBC and MSNBC, you know, just openly cheering the result. And then I watched presenters from um, Fox and, you know, more conservative places, you know, looking grief-stricken by the result and saying things like, you know, we'll be back and... You know, we're not going to take this lying down. Um, well, you know, on the other side, you know, yes, this is a victory for all of us. And the partisanship is just wild. I mean, if you're actually searching American televisions looking for news, you've got no friggin' hope, have you? There's none. Um, so that sort of speaks to the so it, it is now quite kosher for news shows to be as partisan as everything and everyone else. And of course. In that context, what does the Trump conviction mean? It may mean a lot less than we think, um, I think is kind of where this story might end. I saw, uh, I heard some reports just yesterday of there being some focus group research that suggests that this has crawled Trump's appeal with some segments of Republican voters um, and that could ultimately be crucial, but I don't think we've got enough evidence yet to say that has and will happen. And my concern is that um, uh, this will just wash through and the Teflon Trump will just um, march on as he always has. I mean, this is a guy who's about to get the Republican nomination for president after the uh, events of January 6th. You'd have thought that he was never going to run for public office anywhere ever again, and yet here he is. So the resilience of Trump as a figure in the um, media imagination, uh, the resilience of partisanship to just absorb any blow and endure any embarrassment on behalf of their tribe, I I worry um, that this is not going to matter and that for a lot of people this is a partisan persecute, persecution of Trump, a quasi-judicial judicial persecution of Trump, and it's just going to be dismissed by um, a whole lot of voters who are primed to vote Trump. I think that we, if we had hindsight and we went back to the Access Hollywood moment of the 2016 presidential election campaign um, when he was caught, when that tape was released of him on a hot mic, talking to yeah. someone about, you know, how he can get away with, with anything, you can grab women by the pussy, all that kind of stuff. That would have killed any political candidate. No one survives that. No one survives that. And yeah. that was kind of the canary in the coal mine reverse version in which he did survive that, and therefore he survives everything. I think this guy could be in jail and run for president and still – his base will turn out and vote for him. I, I don't think this election is going to be won on the undecideds in the sense, sorry, the Republican strategy, I think, is basically to turn out their base. And that base is locked in. 
and I think there's enough research to suggest that that is the case. Where it will be won and lost is independence um, in sort of outer suburban um, big cities like Atlanta in Georgia or Detroit in Michigan uh, or Milwaukee in Wisconsin. Um, and also the Democratic base. Is the Democratic base motivated enough this time around to turn out once again to vote for Joe Biden? And I think they're the two questions that I think um, we don't have the answer to. And I don't think this trial really has any kind of bearing on well, maybe the independence. Maybe independence will look at this and go. And there's, a, I think, there's been some polls done by um, the I think, oh, sorry, New York Times Siena poll a couple of weeks ago that indicated that people that were that had identified as independent voters and had voted Trump previously were potentially less likely to vote for Trump if he was convicted. But, you know, there's a lot of ifs and buts and maybes in that kind of scenario. Um, but I do think that this 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 presidential election is going to be won or lost on Democratic turnout. Well, I'm a pessimist. I think, and as you know, normally in elections I'm an optimist, but about this one I'm very pessimistic. I think Trump is in the box seat to win. Frightening as that is, I think that, looks like the trajectory at the moment. Um, and I say that because um, I think Biden does look terribly old and is struggling to capture the confidence of the American people. Kamala Harris as vice president doesn't bring anything to the ticket in terms of votes or in terms of reassuring people about that confidence. In fact, perhaps the reverse, a fear that she might end up as president. Um, and then, you know, one of my great frustrations with the Democrats is that they constantly look at Trump and his antics and his outrageous utterances but remain oblivious to how their own conduct just drives people into the arms of the right. Uh, and so we just see the most absurd courses, uh, causes and issues we see, you know, I mean, the immigration debate alone has just wreaked carnage on uh, the Democrat administration. Uh, yeah, you know, we've got uh, all of these sanctuary cities across the United States that are now kind of almost poster places for, uh, you know, Republican allegations against the Democrats. There's a lot going wrong in the centre-left <clears throat> that is driving the simple populist solutions of Trump. There is just far too many people in the United States who are going to hold their nose and vote for Trump because they're motivated by a suite of other issues. Um, and 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 then I, you look at the polls um, in terms of individual states, uh, and you see that uh, it looks very depressing. It looks like. It's easy to see how Trump gets to 300 um, electoral college votes uh, and places like um, Pennsylvania, you know, I mean, what, what were one time, once marginal states like Ohio now solidly red, it, 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 I think it's a depressing picture that's emerging. And it's, you know, it, 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 these Biden's presidency and the issues that are harming it, um, to which he has no apparent solution, and this populist reality TV fantasy show that is just running over us. I mean, if there was a, a panic button to push at Democrat headquarters, they needed to be pushing it quite some time ago. I, I mean, I think that there is, the fact that they've brought forward the presidential debates suggests, and that was brought on by Biden and the Democratic campaign suggests to me that there, that there is a hint that there is a panic button that has been pushed. Normally, the incumbent isn't trying to set the agenda for debates, but the fact that they brought them forward and there's one going to be happening, um, you know, actually while I'm away, while I'm over here, and then another one even earlier, like in September, um, means that I think the Democrats are trying to re, um, uh, re-engage with its base and actually show a contrast to the American public about how cuckoo crazy Trump is and his ideas are crazy versus his safe and secure hands with Joe Biden, notwithstanding his age. I have a more positive, positive I mean, I, I, I take your point about why you're not feeling great about this. 
I feel more positive about the ch- chances of the Democrats in this election only because since 2016, in which where Trump won, every time Trump is on a ballot or he's associated with a ballot, they lose. In the end, when it, when voters rock up to polling day to their polling centre, they yeah. resoundingly vote down Trump or Trump associates. Um, and yeah, the polls right now in those in in you know in Pennsylvania and and in the Rust Belt. Midwest and in the Sun Belt, that those big battleground states aren't looking great. Um, I really hope they start to turn around pretty quickly because they weren't looking great for Obama around about this time as well in 2012 in a re-elect against Romney. They weren't; those polls weren't great for him either. And the economy was in its recovery period from the global financial crisis, but it wasn't being felt in voter land. So it's very similar circumstances. What I would say is we kind of need to sort of keep the, not keep the faith, but just sort of. Keep our eyes on the prize because we've got to take this all the way to November. And I think if we get closer and closer to polling day, it will come down to this question of, do you want Donald Trump to run the country again for another four years? And I think in the end, voters will say no. And I think that um, the Democrats will be elected. I mean, that, one other thing. That, that, question, one, that, that question is the right question. And it, the answer was a lot stronger and more emphatic in the last election than it was in this one. It's decayed. I mean, this idea that, you know, the Americans why is it, will never why is vote. It decayed, why do you think it's decayed, David? Well, because uh, because I think the Biden presidency um, is looking older and frailer, and I the, the immigration debate has just torn carnage through uh, uh, the American body politic. Um, you know, we've got as I said, the sanctuary cities, like, you know, the, the, the crisis going on in New York, um, you know, the fentanyl crisis that is is sort of doubling down on that, all of these issues of urban decay and uh, the desperate need for reinvestment, there's no, the American white working class has abandoned the Democrats and there's every sign that that decay is now spreading to the Latino and Black American communities too, where Democrat support is weakening. Um, and, 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 you know, what's driving that? What's driving that is, um, you know, a whole set of cultural issues, you know, that, 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 that some of the issues that are wedges for the white working class are wedges more broadly. Um, uh, the Black American working class are still very Christian, um, and they ha- haven't been quite as quick to embrace, um, you know, parts of the woke agenda as um, you know Black professors at Harvard have been. So, you know, there's a whole lot of sort of cultural and economic issues coming together, and it just means that, you know, notwithstanding his record as a Civil War hero, Biden, I think, is looking a lot weaker. Um, shall we uh, turn? Uh, our I mean, to I mean if you just go state by state, North Carolina, which is a state the Bidens like to think they have a powerful hold in, um, Pennsylvania, I mean, Georgia looks like a lost cause. I mean, maybe it always does at this point in the cycle, but it, it's very hard for me to see what uh, the pathway is for a Biden re-election. And I really hope I'm wrong. And as I said at the start, um, perhaps this court case and this um, conviction will be the beginning of the end. Perhaps it will peel away enough Republicans and damage his turnout so that he can't be elected. Let's hope so. But my fear is that that lack of enthusiasm will be offset by a wider, deeper lack of enthusiasm for a Biden-Kamala ticket. Well, I'm sure we'll be talking about that as we get closer and closer to uh November. Let's turn our attention to the UK elections. Uh, Pro- Prime Minister uh, uh, Rishi Sunak called an early election scheduled for the 4th of July, very august day in US politics, uh, or US history, I should say. Um, Sunak, the leader of the Tory party, um, is up against Keir Starmer, or Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party. Um, polls for the better part of over over 12 months have indicated that Labor um, should be returned back to the government benches on election day. Just uh, want to get your thoughts on, well, actually before, I mean, <laughs> I actually want to get your thoughts on how on on the the opening day of the campaign and how Rishi Sunak decided to call the election. Like if you ever wanted to compile a video for a candidate of 
how not to start an election campaign, uh, that would be it. Not making the announcement in the pissing rain, not going and visiting the Titanic, not standing in front of a, a poster with the words where your head is, uh, where the words got count behind you, but you're covering up the O. So the word is C U N T. Like all of this stuff. Day one was a bad day for Rishi Sunak. Great day for Labor, but a bad day for the Tories. Um, I just want to get your initial reflections on the UK uh, election. Yeah, I think the UK election is a lot more interesting than it appears to be at first blush. At first blush, it looks like Rishi Sunak's election announcement really was emblematic of 14 years of Tory government. Uh, what a clusterfuck. He, he, I mean, the, I mean, he looked like a drowned rat. He had the Labor Party's anthem blaring in the background. Um, I mean, he just couldn't get a thing right. And that's that's right. I mean, the, the Tories have not been able to get a thing right for 14 years. And what's testament to that is not just my own partisan heart, but this is a Prime Minister whose policy offering is essentially to reintroduce conscription and ban vaping. Um, they're not mentioning Brexit. They're certainly not mentioning the economy. Um, and one of the biggest issues in UK politics, immigration. They daren't talk about that either. Um so 14 years of disaster means that um, uh, Labor um, is primed for victory. But there are some interesting things going on here. I mean, the rest of Europe is moving to the right and on the face of it, the UK is moving to the left. Um, but what we've seen is I, th I think one of the interesting aspects of this election is, is it the death of the Conservative Party? Is it the death of the Tories? And are we going to see a reassembling of right-wing forces in the United Kingdom. Uh, and Farage, uh, Nigel Farage, who's just announced um, his entry into the race with his Reform Party, I think smells this opportunity, and he's got a reasonably good nose for these kinds of opportunities, love him or hate him. Um, uh, Nigel Farage has re-entered the race, I think because in part he smells this opportunity to um, deconstruct and then reconstruct the right of UK politics, because all of the things that are drivers for the populist right um, in the United States and indeed everywhere else, um, issues like you know immigration, um, you know the culture wars, attacks on wokeness, all of those things um, sort of fall in the in the in 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 the United Kingdom because the Tories have been in for fourteen years, and all of these things have gone on in, on their watch. Um, so the sort of standard right-wing critique of government in this case is a standard right-wing critique of the Tory party. And you've seen people like um, uh, Suella Braverman, uh, Braverman, who, you know, came out and talked about two-tier policing, how there was one standard of policing for um, the pro-Hamas demonstrations and another standard of policing um, for the rest of Britons. Um, well, she got sacked for saying that. Um, which, of course, the, the, the sort of reform right loved. Um, but then her, her, she, she went from being a no-name, no-nothing minister of very little account to a national celebrity on the back of her performance and, of course, has discovered that um, you know, there's a big audience for these right-wing opinions, but the Conservative Party's never been out there getting them because the Conservative Party is condemned by these um, voices for being um, uh, you know, essentially collaborators with the whole woke agenda for 14 years in government. So what does all that mean? It means if you don't like the government because it's too right wing, if you don't like the government because it's not competent, if you don't like the government because there are too many migrants, if you don't like the government because it's too woke, if you don't like the government because it's not woke enough, vote Labor. I mean, they essentially drove everybody into the Labor Party's arms. Um, and for a brief and glorious moment there, Keir Starmer and um, the British Labor Party were, you know, getting everybody's vote. Um, and uh, and the issue was really whether there'd be any Tories left in the parliament at all. Well, I think the, re the entry of reform into this contest makes it a bit more interesting because uh, it means that some of those right-wing vo voices and right-wing disaffected populist issues will now have a place to go to. And in a first-past-the-post system, they might have the effect of actually wrecking 
um, the Tory party even more so than it was otherwise going to be wrecked. But I think if reform walks away with something like 20% of the vote, um, which is probably not dissimilar to where the Tories will finish up, um, then that is a, a revolutionary moment in British politics. Um, and who the right-wing party is in the United Kingdom is then up for grabs. Uh, and I, so I think, uh, I think the Tory party is at a real existential crisis. And just to finish the point, so is the Scottish Nationalist Party. Couldn't happen to a more deserving bunch of losers. Um, the Scottish Nationalist Party, for, for a whole series of reasons, overplaying their cards and, as legislators, um, being accused of corruption, a whole range of issues that have uh, bedeviled them, hopefully mean that they go by the way fall by the wayside um, and that Scots finally realise that there's nothing Scottish or nationalist about this non-party uh, and Labor gets a good swag of seats in Scotland which would underpin a strong Labor majority in the House of Commons. So quite a more moving parts than in usual British elections, <clears throat> more interesting than it seems at first blush. Um, it's a, a good summary uh, of the UK situation, I, I, the, my takeaways from that, or, or one of them is that the the on current polling, Islam is likely to have a bigger majority than what Tony Blair got in 1997 when he was first elected to government. That's how sizable the swings are to Labor across its constituencies. Um, and that's just let me interrupt the, though, Stephen. There's one difference though. I, that's well, I absolutely agree, but it's, there's one interesting difference, and that is there was a sense with Blair that it was a positive vote, that he was he was very popular. You know, New Labor, quite it was a positive vote for Labor and Blair. You don't get the sense of that here in the UK election. This is just the, the Conservative Party has run out of excuses and run out of road. And everybody in despair, rather than with any sense of enthusiasm or optimism, is falling into Labor's arms. That's why I think Labor can lose a lot of votes very quickly if there's any sign of momentum anywhere else. I do. I mean, I agree with the first, Look, in 97, the Conservative Party had been in government for, what, I mean, it was Thatcher and then Major, so they'd been in a long, long time, and they were running out of road as well. But you are right, Tony Blair certainly got ele elected to govern on optimism, on a positive agenda, and that's not what we're getting from Keir Starmer. Very similar to the way that Albo got elected in Australia. Kind of elected in a way of, like, let's just shut the fuck up and let the other <laughs> side stuff it up and let the voters do, the, do all the heavy lifting, and then we'll get into government. And, I, you know, you and I as campaigners, mm -hmm. then that's not the kind of campaign we want to run, right? Um, but in the end, we also just want to get into government. So sometimes Too I'm much. also pre prepared to let that through to the keeper and go, well, if it just gets a result, it gets a result. I am interested in the Farage stuff, though. I, I just don't, I, mean, I think it's going to hurt the Tories, obviously, but that first past the post system means that it could just dilute the primary vote. Well, there is only a primary vote uh, of the Tories, and then it would then probably benefit either Labor or a Lib Dem or whatever, who is the main candidate running against that centre, right, far right, ticket. But don't underestimate how many Labor votes or you know, what we imagine as Labor votes Farage appeals to as well. Yeah, you true. know, the red wall, the, the British working, the British white working class in particular. Have a look at where the Brexit vote was much stronger than the Remain vote and you'll find, you know, lots of uh, white British working class voters. So the Labor Party can't be sanguine about this and say, Oh, Nigel was just going to be a tornado of carnage across the right. Um, it's a broader, wider threat than that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a, else... it might only be in its early stages of evolution, but it might grow very quickly in the next few years if the Conservative Party falls to pieces like it very well may. Farage has ran seven times previously and lost on every occasion. I know he got elected to Europe, the European Parliament, but... Every time he runs for Westminster, he loses. I wonder if he'll be able to break the duck in this election. We'll see. We will. Um, and, you know, it, it, in a first, it, I mean, he's had a remarkable impact on British politics for someone who's never won a seat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's quite it's um, incredibly remarkable. But it hasn't stopped, you know, like on reality TV where he became, you know, a thing. Now he's a news presenter on GB News. 
uh, well, I guess until the moment he ran for parliament again, um, he's sort of seen as the father of Brexit, um, justifiably, I think. So um, uh, a more formidable figure than his CV might present, and you might think at first first impressions. Yeah. Um, shall we return home? Certainly to... more so than Rushi Sunak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Should we return to domestic politics now? I want to get your thoughts. I know it's been a, it's a while since the federal budget was yeah, handed down, but I, I just want to get your reaction to the budget from a political standpoint. We had Emma Dawson and um, uh, Ed Kavanagh from the two respective sort of centre-left think tanks on to talk about the economics of the budget, but I actually want to get your political reaction to it. Yeah, I listened to those podcasts. I thought that their policy analysis was all well and good, but politically I think the outstanding uh, quality of this budget is how quickly it vanished from centre stage. I mean, budgets have been disappearing faster and faster. They used to sort of be a much bigger punctuation point in the political calendar than they are now, but even by the decaying standards of the contemporary era, this budget disappeared quickly. Um, and. And I think that's interesting. And I mean, it did remind people about the tax cuts, the power bill rebates. It sort of launched the future made in Australia stuff. So that was all good stuff. Um, but it only sat around for a couple of days before it was then um, overtaken, really, by um, really the policy uh, agenda of the opposition. Um, and how embarrassing to say that because the opposition has such a miserable policy offering. But Dutton in his uh, budget in reply speech on the Thursday sort of managed to turn everyone's thoughts back to immigration and immigration policy. Um, and with that underpinned by um, Labor's policy was in the immigration space, the national conversation just switched really quickly. And so I thought the most outstanding thing about the budget is how quickly people forgot it. In a contemporary sense, I've always thought that voters just don't give a shit or pay attention to the budget. I remember a good friend of yours and mine, John Armitage, did focus groups on uh, the Victorian budget. And he asked the group about what are your thoughts on the Victorian budget? And they all went, oh, does the state government do one as well? Oh, I guess yeah. they probably have to, don't they? Yeah, yeah. That'd be, that, oh, I suppose so. Yeah, that's right. No clue. And then I get that. Like, who cares about the budget, really? I mean... Unless you yeah, but state budgets have always got a lot less coverage. I mean, oh. I, I, even when federal budgets were big news, state budgets still struggled to be newsworthy. But I don't think they're. I don't think they're attractive. I don't think they are. I'm talking about the federal budget as well. It's a boring piece of theatre, really. Like no one watches it. They might just, you know, read the front page of the paper ten years ago and go, "Oh, that's what was in the budget." But no one reads the paper anymore. You know, so how are they going to know what the hell was in the budget anyway? Unless you really stuff it up, like the Abbott budget, the Abbott uh, was it the Abbott hockey budget, that first one where they just absolutely twenty thirteen. Yeah. yeah, okay, everyone knew about that because it was so bad, and it really actually directly impacted on people's lives. Uh, but broadly speaking, I don't think people tune in on the budget. Well, they didn't tune in on this one. That's that, that's for sure. Um, yeah, but I mean, the do... expectations are here, not here. <laughs> um, I mean, you do want the budget, though, to kind of reassemble and refocus a government and its priorities. It's it's the moment where, um, you know, the government gets its uh, proverbial together and um, with a renewed focus marches into the rest of the year. Um, and you do want, and, and you sort of saw that the government was doing that. I mean, it delivered a surplus, important bit of um atmospherics and scene setting. Um, it launched the future made in Australia. Perhaps these things are going to um, have a slow burn and, and continue. I, I mean, I certainly hope they continue to be fleshed out um, in coming months. But I guess my point is that even by the decayed standards of the moment, this budget seemed to vanish fast. Um, and the national conversation really did switch um, particularly to immigration. But, you know, it, it does feel to me like there's something of a policy vacuum at the federal level um, and it's being filled um, far too much by the opposition. So on that, 
and we'll get to immigration in a second. The things that I took, I had to go on RAF at scene on ABC Radio in Melbourne the week after the budget or the week of the budget. And I sort of came out and said, look, you know, I thought that they did a great job. Jim Chalmers did a great job. And he framed up almost like a grid-like suite of areas in which that's what the campaign, the election campaign was going to be on. I sort of said it was climate. It was about investment in infrastructure. It was uh, maintaining strong economic um, credentials. And it was sort of that kind of supporting young people and women. And that's if that's the frame they're going to talk on, then that's going to be a difficult place for the Conservatives to fight Labor on. And that's all fine and well if you then continue to keep on talking about it. But we're not talking about any of those four things right now because all we're talking about right now is immigration. Well, uh, violence against women, I think, is an interesting case study, for instance. This is an issue that, um, you know, driven by the appalling statistics and some of the um, you know, atrocities that have um, gained media coverage in recent times. This is an issue that kind of really came to the fore on the eve of the budget. Um, and the government, seeing that, came up with a policy response um, and and some money. Um, but what's the reaction been to that? Well, I mean, the ABC in particular has been quite unremitting in its criticism that not enough has been done. And and on morning radio um, and in and in its news broadcasts um, makes the point again and again and again about all of the things that need to be done and should be done and you know the appalling um, uh, situation that you know, of, of turning so many women away and you know, uh, you know uh, and and the government hasn't done enough. Now, from a political perspective, there is no prospect, of course, that the coalition will do more. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the frame. This It sort of ends up becoming really a, a persistent... So this issue, where the Labor Party is the only party of government that can and will and has done anything about it, nonetheless sort of bleeds into being a running sore rather than a positive because the persistent claim of all of the key stakeholders is Labor hasn't done enough, the government hasn't done enough. And, of course, you've always got the Greens yapping on the side saying we'd do more and Labor should do more. Um, so sometimes these issues don't turn out to help the Labor Party even though you imagine they might. Do you think the government's in a bit of a funk right now? Yeah, I do. I do think it's in a bit of a funk at the moment. I I, I, I saw recently um, the Prime Minister sort of attacking Dutton directly on his record in government when he was um, responsible for immigration. And I just thought to myself, you know, the Prime Minister shouldn't be doing his own dirty work like this, point number one. Um, you know, the, 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 the people of Australia shouldn't see our leader snarling and hectoring into the microphone. Um, that job has to be done, but it has to be done by somebody else. And my second thought was, do we really want to spend time in the weeds with Dutton talking about immigration and visas and who's in and who's out? How much, how many, how how big an issue do we want that to be? Because um, you know, Dutton in particular and the and the Liberal Party in general just have a much stronger brand strength in this policy area than Labor does. Um, it's particularly problematic for us at the moment, and we'll come to that. Um, why are we spending valuable time dragging the national conversation here? So it was bad optics, bad strategy, and I just I, we just see that kind of thing more often than I would like. To uh, your first point, we, we will get to the immigration stuff in a moment, but I, I want to... I, mean, I, I I agree with you. I don't understand why Albanese feels the need to keep on even mentioning Dutton's name. Daniel Andrews never, ever, ever, ever said the name of his opposition leader, nor would he even mention the party. You know, Daniel always did the, if you've got a question about, well, the opposition leader has said blah, blah, blah on this particular policy issue, he would say they're not relevant to my plans for the people of Victoria and then move on. But Anthony Albanese cannot resist, cannot resist, because he's a brawler in the old parliamentary sense of actually constantly talking about his opponent and giving him oxygen. Just shut the fuck up. Stop 
mentioning his name. No one knows who he is. But you keep on telling everyone who he is and they'll all remember who he is when it comes election time. Like, stop mentioning his name. You're giving him free air and it just frustrates me so greatly. I don't know whether I've had, because I've had 17 hours on an aeroplane, I've got clearer sense, but it just it just annoys me so much. No, me too. And I think you kind of answered the question there. It, it, I think in part it's because he's, you know, a parliamentary brawler. Um, and, and I mean that in a positive sense. Like, you know, he's leader of the House, um, it, one of the key debaters Labor has relied on for decades now. Um, you know, the, the the left relied on at the New South Wales Convention and the Labor Party's relied on in our national parliament. Um, and he just can't help himself. And he perhaps wonders whether anyone could do it better and maybe they couldn't. But it, it goes to my point, really, which is he has to have the discipline to not do it. He has to have the discipline to give that job to somebody else. Um, because his job is to be a statesman and talk about, you know, the positive future of the country um, and not Mr Dutton. No. Should we talk about immigration? Because, yes, I think that straight after the budget, you could see that the Libs were trying to pivot to immigration and they wanted to drag it back onto the, to the, into the national debate. But And obviously we wouldn't want to, but, geez, we've made it easy for them. Like, we've really made it easy for them. We have. I mean, I think in our there was in the in the budget and then in the budget in reply speech of the opposition leader, immigration did rear its head in a policy sense. So they're tying student visas to the amounts of student housing was an initiative of federal labour, a very good one, I thought. And then Dutton kind of went one step further and said overall immigration should be tied to overall housing supply. Um, which might be a problematic policy in public policy terms, but I think is great politics. And then, as you say, we came in and made sure this got centre stage with um, our own immigration disasters. And aren't we clever giving our disasters such cool branding, Direction 99? Like, you know, I mean, we, we, we've given our fuck up a movie title, haven't we? Uh, how clever is that? So, um, you know, as Maxwell Smart would say, well done, 99. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it obviously just brings a whole lot of themes together in a way that's great for the Conservatives. Um, you know, too many immigrants coming here and committing crimes um, and a Labor government that doesn't have the guts to lock them up or send them home. Now, that's the shorthand rolling through the suburbs and no doubt rolling through our primary vote um, uh, and leaving us looking paralysed um, as this issue tears through us. And, you know, I'm, it, 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 you know it's, it's an issue made by the High Court. The Prime Minister doesn't want to give up a minister. I get all of that. That's all. And that... That might be the right judgment. Too early to tell. Don't know, but certainly an issue that sees centre stage and is hurting us now. It has um, the Liberals' version of work choices for me. If you recall, during the work choices campaign, remember at the start, Howard came out and said, "No Australian worker will be worse off under work choices." And then the union movement just can continue to roll out examples of workers under the work choices legislation that were worse off day after day, or week after week, and it just. It was death by a thousand cuts in terms of that campaign. To the end, in the end, you know, voters, um, the credibility of the argument that no work would be worse off was completely shot. And it was a it was an anchor around uh, uh, Howard and the government. And what I worry here is is there are so many examples that the liberals yes. are just bringing up constantly of every these, stabbing, the, every bashing, oh, every rape. Um, every time, you know, we're monitoring these people with drones. Oh, hang on a minute. Sorry. No, we're not monitoring them with drones. Um, you know, as soon as they reoffend, we'll lock them up. Oh, sorry. As it turns out, we're not locking them up when they reoffend. Uh, it, it's been a disaster. Uh, and, you know, just it, it speaks to, you know, it's just gold for Dutton. This is an issue around which he's personally seen to have been strong on, um, you know, He's always said, you know, Labor will be weak on immigration. Everyone knows he'll be strong on immigration. Stop the boats, all that nonsense. Um, uh, it It's um, carnage, yeah. And and I don't know how we make it stop. No, nor do I. Um, 
which is a disappointing and um, concerning. Thought. And obviously, if your name was Andrew Giles, you'd be needing to find an answer to that question really quickly. Yeah. Before before they decide your resignation is the way we make it stop. Um, we well, need to find a way to make it stop. I mean, maybe, I mean, the secretary has got to be held account for some of the decisions that were made. It's not just the minister, obviously, but like, uh, and I'm not going to be on this podcast advocating for Andy Giles to get punted, but certainly the secretary, who, you know, is in charge of this department. They have to be held accountable as well. I, I think that's where I'd start. First of all, anyway, I'm trying to think what Daniel would do and then probably the secretary would get punted um, before they do any anything else like, and start to look at your, your own people, but I think that it would be a good starting place anyway, just to show quick, decisive decision. This is a problem. We get it. We're out in front of it. I don't know if that would help politically, but it might be necessary um, in terms of, you know, the good public policy management of this issue because the department has clearly um, failed egregiously on several key issues, you know, like informing the minister about when these cases um have come up, informing the minister about when um, these cases have uh, have got results that might be politically problematic. There's all sorts of reporting that it seems the minister has requested of the department that has not happened, um, and that's just and and so the department's failures have just piled embarrassments on the minister, and he he's you know it, it it's hurting him obviously, and it's yeah. hurting Labor. Yeah, it is. And, you know, as somebody said recently, and I thought this was an interesting observation, you know, can you imagine any of this happening when Pizzullo was in charge? You know, now I know we got rid of Pizzullo because of his clandestine communications with senior Liberal power brokers. I first met um, Pizzullo when he was Deputy Chief of Staff to Kim Beasley, so I, I remember when he was a Labor staffer, a, a very controversial and formidable public servant as he became, but, you know, even his enemies concede he was brilliantly competent um, and yeah, perhaps we're missing him. Let's um, let's turn our attention to our second last topic. And as I do that, I'm struggling. I'm currently competing with a A380 that looks like it's about to take off to Tokyo, so I apologise if the noise in the background is um, not <laughs> great. But anyway, um, uh, the war in Israel and Gaza. We, I think you may have touched on it in the last show. Um, but I want to get your reflections on it in terms of the impact it's having on do domestic politics or maybe more so in sort of the global West um, as this war continues to drag out. Um, I don't really want to litigate the war itself. Uh, I think that's a it's a lose-lose proposition for whoever listens to the show. But I just want to get your sense of how is this impacting domestic politics? Yeah, I mean, arguing about this is a bit like tic-tac-toe, isn't it? You sort of, you, you can tell from the opening moves how the conversation's going to go. And we've all had the arguments a thousand times and no one gets persuaded. Um, that, that, uh, this is a kind of a, uh, that's just the way, I mean, this, that's perhaps part of a future of the, um, um, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict for as long as I've been alive, but it seems particularly true at the moment. Um no one's being persuaded and everyone's shouting. Um, I, I, I think this issue is of um, great significance uh, in terms of what it's doing to the body politic for a few reasons. Um, the first is I think uh, it's a conflict that transfixes the attention of our media and political elites. And so we've just talked about a whole lot of politics across you know, the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia. And, uh, you know, in all of those places, the number one issue is the Arab-Israeli conflict and the war in Gaza. Um, and that's the, and that's what the journalists want to talk about. Um, that's what the politicians are being obliged to talk about. That's what the activists are making us talk about. Um, uh, so it just has this giant discombobulating effect. Um, and I don't think we can underestimate that. And then the second thing I think it does is I think, and this is, is I think ultimately it's bad for the centre-left mostly um, because I think the centre, you know, too many voters um, watch 
these demonstrations marching through the streets of London or wherever and see, you know, imagery of, you know, they see the Palestinian flags, calls for jihad, anti-Semitic sloganeering, um, so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and I think a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people recoil from that. You know, why are these foreign conflicts being brought to my streets? Why are these foreign fights playing out on my street corner? Um, and, and I think it has the effect of far too often of driving uh, swathes of people into the arms of the right because they identify that as being something that it, that is of the left and supported by the left. Now, I've spent, you know, my whole life arguing this debate uh, with from an essentially, um, uh, I guess, what would be characterised as a pro-Israeli perspective, and I always strongly believed that it was very unhelpful for this conflict to be to become a partisan one in our politics, you know, that, that it became an issue. But I mean, it was always an issue inside Labor. But if it became an issue simply between Labor and Liberal, then that was bad for Israel, but it would be bad for our politics too. And I think we're, we're, we're very close to that, aren't we? I mean, um, uh, support for Israel is now very much a minority position in the, in, in the centre-left. And the recent ALP state conference it mustered, you know, something like 20 or 25% of the support from delegates. So um, gone are the days where there was um, an ability to manage these issues um, uh, inside um, the Labor Party. There's now an overwhelming support for the sort of hardline Palestinian position. That means this becomes a fight in the, as far as the public is concerned, between, um, you know, Labor and Liberal um, all too often um, uh, you know, Keir Starmer and Biden are doing their best to make sure that doesn't happen in other places. But th th that's where this issue is evolving to. And I just think for a lot of ordinary voters, that ends up reflecting badly on Labor. And then in terms of the discombobulation, you know, federal Labor's response to the conflict here in Australia, I just think has been um, it, pathetic. I mean, it's been banal. I mean, they, the federal Labor has from time to time issued statements saying, you know, we call for a ceasefire and we want the hostages returned. Or a statement saying, you know, Israel has to withdraw from Gaza and there can be no future for Hamas. Or they'll condemn the massacre of the 7th of October last year, but then declare support for the unilateral state of Palestine. These, the, the, you know, this is trying to have your cake and eat it too. This is not choosing a side. This is a federal Labor that's just desperately trying to avoid, um, you know, is it, trying to politically manage the challenge between, on the one hand, what they fear, the you know, much of the community want, and on the other hand, what they know much of the caucus and the party want. And so their solution is to be weak and vacillating and to issue these public policy or foreign policy pronouncements that are absurd. Like how do you have a ceasefire and get the hostages back? Can Penny Wong or anyone else explain that to me? How do you get Israel to withdraw and make sure there's no future for Hamas? What's going to happen? Is UNRWA going to go in and arrest Hamas? Um, and, and, you know, I mean, France has Bastille Day. Uh, you know, America has the 4th of July. Under our plan, Palestine's going to have Massacre Day. You know, the day the nation was born, the day that an independent Palestinian state was born was on Massacre Day when they brutally butchered and massacred and raped in the most bestial way imaginable, 1,200 people, and kidnapped another 300. That, Under our plan, that's the, the day Palestinian statehood finds its identity. So um, it's sort of a... It's sort of a hopeless performance, I think, from federal Labor. And we can see why, because they're trying, this is not foreign policy pronouncements of substance. This is all driven by domestic politics and intra-party politics. Um, and this is happening everywhere. This is happening across the Democratic Party. This is happening across the British Labor Party. Um, and... Uh, and it's transfixing the interests of activists and journalists and media commentators everywhere, and it takes up a big part of the conversation. 
Um, I was talking to a, a former federal colleague of mine recently who was talking about how he thought Israel's um, conduct in this war was bad for Israel because it was turning so much of the world against it. And we can argue against that or maybe not. But but I thought, why is it? It, it, it may be a problem for Israel, but guess what? It's also a problem for us. Um, it, 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 this is a debate that is a problem for us um, as well as... It, it, uh, and perhaps less of a problem for Israel. Um, so uh, I think it's got an outsized, oversized place in our um, politics, and that's going to stay the, that way uh, for months to come. David, do you think that, I mean, the Labor Party has long held a view, and Mike Butler I thought was actually quite strong on this. Uh, he said some public statements maybe a week or two ago Uh the Labor Party constantly debates at our national conference that we support a two-state solution, that we believe that the state of Israel should exist and that beside that there should be eventually a Palestinian state, both living side by side within their own safe and secure borders. And that's the, I guess that's the foundation of our position on this. Do you think that... I mean, the first question I'll ask you is, has the debate sort of shifted away from that? Like, has the Labor government moved away from those foundations? Because what I think in the public is, is that we are so far away from a two-state two state solution now than we've ever been, that I think that both within the Israeli government, you can't even say that word anymore, but also within the Palestinian side, they're not talking about that either. They're talking about not wanting Israel to exist at all. So I think both sides are being run right now by the zealots of their two communities and therefore the the, the moderates and the, and, the, and the peacemakers that we had in the... 80s and 90s, just don't seem to be winning the argument anymore. Well, it's very fashionable in um, left-wing circles when looking at this issue to say, well, you know, Netanyahu's atrocious, corrupt, um, self-serving, leads a government of appalling right-wing figures who have said appalling things. Um, the two-state solution is um, on the rocks because of um, unconscionable Israel's, Israeli conduct. That's that's the sort of cool thing to say while sounding um, uh, reasonable. Uh, but And all of that, as it happens, might be true, but what it fails to do is apply any pressure or any analysis to the Palestinian side of the equation. Um, because while a two-state solution might remain very controversial in Israeli circles, it's not controversial in Palestinian circles at all. They're against it. Um, they will not accept it. Um, when reasonable offers have been made, they have been refused. Um, and I think all too often we think we're talking about a, a, war, a conflict that's about territory, but it's beyond that now. Uh, this is an Islamist death cult whose objective is the genocidal elimination of the State of Israel. Um, and if anyone thinks at the end of that project, they're going to stop and be happy, then they don't understand um, the Islamist um, and Muslim Brotherhood agenda. The, the, so there seems to be no pressure in these polite conversations in the left, uh, no pressure applied to, you know, why can't Hamas accept a two-state solution? Why can't Fatah accept a two-state solution? Why can't, um, you know, the president of the Palestinian Authority, who's now in the 19th year of his four-year term, why can't he accept one? Um, uh, so, uh, yes, a two-state solution is in crisis. In large part, it's in crisis because one side of the argument will not countenance it, um, and when the rubber has hit the road, has never countenanced it. And on the Israeli side, because, you know, after the Second Intifada, um, the Israeli left lost hope and voices like Netanyahu dominated the debate. I don't know how to then change this topic into electoral redistributions in the Australian federal <laughs> parliamentary system, but I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe another question of territory. I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, the, the AEC have released... Drawing lines on a map matters here too. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. The AEC released their first draft of the the redistribution of the boundaries for the federal, electorate, federal electorates leading up to the next federal election. 
uh, everyone thought that Victoria was going to lose a seat and WA was going to gain one based on population shifts. Uh, that happened. The seat of Higgins, held by Labor Party, uh, was um, abolished, well, is suggested to be abolished, um, and uh, WA gained a seat. Um, your thoughts on this redistribution based on what we've seen which reminding everyone it's a draft there's a second round of um application to go in but what do you think about the what the AC have done here um well i certainly looked at it with great interest um i think western australia is such a critical state for this federal government and the redistribution was good for us in western australia it didn't seem to degrade greatly the margins of any existing Labor seat and it created another notionally Labor seat. So um, it was unequivocally a good redivision for Labor in the West and that's excellent. Um, in terms of Victoria, as you say, we lost a seat we knew we were going to. Um, you'll remember the Victorian division of the Liberal Party forgot to get its submission in um, and so we never made a submission about it's or at least got one in. They are pathetic. They are pathetic. They are, pathetic. They are the worst branch of the Liberal Party in this country. Yes, but I do remember uh, putting a lot of work into redivisions. In, of, in fact, I remember discussing this with uh, Daniel Andrews, you know, 25 years ago, and and us musing about the fact that you know if you don't put a submission in at all, it may not change a thing. Um, you know, I'm very very um, sceptical about how much attention. Uh, these redivision, uh, the, all these electoral commissions and redivision commissions pay to party submissions. Uh, so having said that, I think uh, it, it's a redivision that has potentially some pain in it for Victorian Labor. Um, obviously losing Higgins um, is hard, particularly because I like our member there so much. But we kind of lost the seat in a way that there's not an obvious successor to the seat either. You know, a chunk of it put into Hotham, a chunk put into Chisholm, a chunk put into the new Kuyong. There's not an obvious successor seat um, for the incumbent MP to target. Um, that's the first challenge. And the second challenge is um, the changes to the boundaries in Melbourne mean that uh, you know, a chunk of new voters has gone into uh, what I used to call Melbourne ports, but I now need to call, um, what do I call it, Steve? Thank you. McNamara. It's picked up Windsor. Uh, the, my, the seat of Cooper has got Clifton Hill put back into it. But, uh, Clifton Hill used to be in the old seat of Batman. It's now been put back into the seat of Cooper. That's a good thing for the Greens. And more dramatically, we've seen some green suburbs uh, in the north of the federal seat of Melbourne switched over to Wills. So what does all this mean? I think it means that the Greens' challenge to Labor in Wills has gone from being serious to diabolical. I think it means that the Greens' challenge to Labor in Cooper has, got, has gone from, um, you know, something that has to be watched to being serious. In both of those seats, we're going to see the Greens take their alliance with or their sort of hoped for and projected alliance with um, uh, Islamic communities out for its first outing. So we'll see how that goes. And, uh, and that's why there's this unremitting criticism of Labor and Labor policy concerning uh, the war in the Middle East because the Greens think there's electoral mileage in it in some of these places. As well as, of course, it's suiting the ideological predilections of the Greens. What does it mean uh, for um, uh, Josh Burns? I, you know, I, I, I'd be interested in your reflections on that because you know the seat really well. Um, but so a tougher contest vis-à-vis -vis the Greens, um, a, a continuing tough contest between Liberals and Teals, um, I, I feel like these boundaries will hold up well in good times for Labor, but I worry that in a tough election we could see a lot of real estate fall. I agree with all of that reflection. Uh, to Melbourne Port slash McNamara, the wills coming, uh, sorry, winds are coming back into, which is the southern part of Paran coming back into the electorate, 
is a concern for Josh. However, where he actually had most of his swings against him at the last federal election was in Caulfield, and it was to the Greens. And there's a view that obviously there are more rental accommodation in Caulfield around the university, but also a lot of younger, obviously for those who are not familiar with the electorate of Caulfield, of um, McNamara Caulfield's got a high Jewish population. And there was a view that younger Jewish voters, so I'm talking 18 to 25, uh, voted green at the last federal election. Uh, and so the question is, do they come home and go back to voting for who their parents voted for uh, at this election because of what's happened in uh, in the Middle East? And talking to anecdotally, talking to the, you know some people I know who who are you know uh, culturally Jewish but not religiously Jewish have said since October seven, I found myself reconnecting with my community more than I've ever done before. And I wonder if those younger voters that did vote during the last election actually come back and either vote Liberal or Labor or whoever their parents voted for. And so we might see some swings back to the two major parties. And hopefully that saves Josh. Um, plus, he's a very good candidate and everyone's a good campaign. But broadly speaking, I am worried about Wills. I'm really worried about Wills. And your assessment of that is bang on. Yeah, I mean, I worry that the sort of um, uh, 7 October war means that the Jewish community is now sort of more locked into uh, the Liberal Party than it has ever been before. And that we'll see that in its in how it votes. Um, it's hard to imagine how they might vote green, but you know, strange strange things happen. Um, yeah, and Wills is Wills is a struggle. Um, the fact that the leader of the Greens in the state parliament has announced she's running as the Greens candidate in Wills, and she did that before the redivision, is a sign that you know, as we saw in 2016, when the Greens sort of national target was. Batman and Wills, I worry that we're going to see, and, and and Melbourne Ports actually, to be fair, in 2016. So it was very much in Victoria, in a city, was where the Greens put all of their time and money and people. Uh, then in subsequent elections, they drifted off to the eastern suburbs of Melbourne and then they went to Brisbane. Uh, my concern is that the next federal election, they'll be back in inner city Melbourne. And on that note, David, I need to run and get, in a, get on a plane and go to Canada. And if I don't, then I'm going to be stuck in LA for another night. So I appreciate your time. This has been a great Things chat. are bad, Stephen, but we don't have to run to Canada just yet. <laughs> yeah, nice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hold you to that. I'm going to leave it on that one. David Fenny, once again, thanks very much for coming on the show. Always appreciate your insights. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you uh, next month. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Hey there, thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.